lecture 28 on the series on acoustic materials and metamaterials. So, in this lecture we will begin our discussion on a new type of acoustic metamaterial which is a membrane type acoustic metamaterial. So, first of all I will describe to you what do you mean by membranes, what is the difference between a limp and a stiff membrane. Then uh, I will go into the details of what is a membrane type metamaterial or a membrane type acoustic metamaterial, what are the different types of such membrane type AMMs and then we will look into one small uh, derivation on what is the vibrational response of a limp membrane and how does it make it a potential, how does this benefit the membrane type AMM so that they can be used for adaptive noise control. And finally, I will end with the discussion on the different unit cells that are proposed for a membrane type AMM. So, first of all what are membranes? So, if you look around in your real world, you will see that for example, the diaphragm of the loudspeaker or the diaphragm of a microphone, these are all thin panels of pliable, these are thin pliable sheets of a material. So, what is meant by the word pliable is that it is like a thin sheet of material which can be folded, which can be bent, which can be, which is malleable. So, it can be bent or molded or folded into different shapes. So, that is a thin pliable sheet of material. So, membranes are thin pliable sheet of materials and some of the very best examples could be that if you see any percussion instrument like a tabla or a drum. So, if you see in this figure here, so here the top of a tabla or this drum which actually hit it starts to vibrate and it creates a sound. So, all this is an example of membrane which are nothing but thin pliable sheets of material. Even the human ear drum is a membrane. So, unlike rigid bodies, so, so if we have a rigid body, if you give some excitation, the whole body moves as a whole, the body moves as a whole, it does, it is the vibration or the deformation does not, <coughs> the vibration does not depend upon the location of that particular member inside the body. But if you have such thin membranes, so in that case they act more as a distributed mass system so, when some excitation is given to them, then the vibrational response will be dependent upon the point in the membrane. So, it will be dependent upon the x, y, z co coordinates of the point in the membrane. So, that is why they are not considered as moving as a whole or stiff bodies, but rather a distributed mass system. So, the membranes they can be of two types, they can either be very limp or they can be stiff and very stiff membranes. So, in the previous lectures we discussed about panel resonators or a panel absorber and then we also discussed about a perf micro perforated panel absorber. So, in all this case we had the thin sheet of material, but that material was hard and stiff. So, it was a panel. So, even they can be called as membrane, but they are more commonly called as panels. So, stiff membranes are commonly called as panels. So, what is the difference between a stiff and a limp membrane? So, you can visualize it in this way that if you have a stretched string and if you revolve that stretched string in 360 degrees, so you get a 3D version and that is a membrane. So, a membrane is like a 3D version of a stretched string in the same way if you have a beam and you revolve it 360 degrees then you get a plate kind of a material. So, it is a, so the plate or a stiff membrane becomes a 3D analog of a beam. So, over here what you see is that in the limp membrane is it behaves as if it is a stretch string, but in two dimensions. So, I am sorry I was talking about 3D, it is a 2D analog. So, here this string is in one dimension, but when you talk about this string in two dimensions revolve it 360 degrees, you end up with a stretched membrane. So, the main criteria of defining this as limp or stiff is that the bending stiffness for <coughs> if a bending stiffness of a membrane is almost close to 0 or it is a very small value, it can be treated as a limp membrane. And if the bending stiffness 
of a particular material or a membrane is a non-zero high value which cannot be neglected, then it becomes a panel or a stiff membrane. So, in the case of limp membrane, when a transverse load is given to the membrane, then in plane normal tensions are generated. Whereas, in the case of such beam type panels, when the transverse loading is given to them, shear stresses and bending moment are generated. This shows a cross sectional view of this case. So, overall in this uh, what uh, the main distinction between a limp and a uh, stiff membrane is that limp membrane the bending stiffness is negligible that is not the case with stiff membrane and in the limp membrane whenever some transverse loading or excitation is given then tension is developed across the membrane. Whereas, in the case of a plate or a panel when you give some excitation then shear stress will be developed and bending moment will be developed and things like buckling and bending of the particular plate can take place. So, from here onwards throughout this course work when I am discussing about membrane type acoustic metamaterials, what I will mean by membrane is it will be the limp membranes i.e. those membranes or structures with no bending stiffness only in plane tension acting on them when a transverse load is applied to them. Stiff membranes will be referred to as panels. So, let us begin with the discussion on such membranes which are limp. So, what is a membrane type acoustic metamaterial? So, from the name itself you can guess that okay, this is an acoustic metamaterial which is made up of membrane. So, here it is a acoustic metamaterial where the unit cell contains a stretched membrane as its primary construction unit. And it was first proposed by Yang et al in 2008 and I have given you the reference to the paper here which you can read for you if you are further interested. But I will be discussing all the findings of the paper in my lecture also. So, this kind of metamaterial is actually a negative density metamaterial. So, here it can it can be it is able to provide a total absorption of sound waves or a total reflection of sound waves as the case may be by tuning the membranes to have effective mass density less than equal to 0. So, in the regions where this density becomes negative these membranes show extraordinary properties they can behave perfect they can behave like a perfect sound blocker or in certain cases they can behave as a perfect sound absorber. So, these are negative density acoustic metamaterials. So, let us see what are the various classifications. So, so far two types of acoustic two types of membrane type acoustic metamaterials have been proposed and this shows you the unit cells for the two types of membrane type acoustic metamaterials. So, here in the first case you have this is a wave waveguide this is a section of a waveguide or you can say this is a section of a heavy massy but hollow tube. So, a hollow tube which is thick in, in the material whose material is very thick and dense. So, such kind of hollow tube is used as a waveguide. So, it becomes a small section of the waveguide and on the top of this tube a stretched membrane is attached. In the second kind of material it is the same thing you again have a heavy massy hollow tube and on the top of the hollow tube an elastic membrane is attached which is stretched. So, you can call this as a stretched membrane and this is also a stretched membrane. But in the second uh, unit cell there is also a center mass. So, there is a mass attached at the center of this elastic membrane. So, these are the two different types of unit cells that have been proposed and usually they are connected in series. So, one unit cell followed by another unit cell followed by another unit cell and so on and a big long tube can be constructed with small sections like this unit cell. 
So, in, in some of the later lectures on membrane type acoustic metamaterial, I will actually show you how these unit cells are arranged to make it into a big structure. So, first of all, let us just study about the unit cells and how these unit cells impart this negative density to this acoustic metamaterial. So, uh, before I begin with the derivation of effective mass density for a particular unit cell, I will first discuss that if there is a stretched elastic membrane here, what will be the vibration response of this stretched elastic membrane when some sound wave hits it or some form of excitation is given to it? How will this particular membrane respond to any acoustic excitation? So, here let us consider we are considering a thin membrane which is uniformly stretched in all directions and some transverse vibrations with small amplitude and it undergoes transverse vibrations with small displacement amplitudes. So, you can imagine for example, you have a drum. So, in this kind of instrument here. So, what I am what we are going to study here is that let us say we have a drum here. So, this is the stretched membrane here, a stretched membrane and then suddenly somebody hits the drum. So, he or she that is hitting the drum is providing a transverse a transverse excitation. So, this is the plane of the membrane and normal to the plane of membrane some excitation is given in the form of for example, hitting the drum or hitting the tabla. Then what will be the form of vibration response? So, let us derive this. So, here what uh, the first assumption is that the tension that is developed will be uniformly. There is a uniform tension or uh, the membrane has a uniform tension it is stretched uniformly. So, if I consider a small infinite small area of this membrane and the and the displacement then would be a function because obviously, here the displacement will depend upon where it is located in the membrane. So, it will be a function of both x, z and t. Here x, z is the plane of the membrane and y is the transverse direction. So, again showing you this elemental area. So, you know that tension is force per unit length. So, if this is an elemental area where this is this length is d x, this length is d z. So, the total area is d x into d z and the tension is acting uniformly everywhere. So, t is the tension acting uniformly everywhere. So, the force acting along this direction will be what? It will be the tension multiplied by the length across which it is acting. So, it will be t into d z because tension is the force per unit length. So, force is equal to tension multiplied by the length across which this tension is acting. So, in the same way in this direction the force will be tension multiplied by the length across which it is acting. So, it will be T dx. So, now that we have the forces acting along the different directions let us consider a side view of this membrane. So, this is how the membrane looks like from the side and we are considering this d x, the d x uh, it is we are considering how does it look like along the x axis. So, this is a stretched membrane if it was not stretched sorry this is a membrane that has already been excited and it started to vibrate. If it was not vibrating it will there was no excitation then in the steady state it will be horizontal right because the membrane is along the x z plane. So, it will be horizontal, but now because of the excitation it undergoes some transverse displacement. So, let us say this is the displacement shape of the membrane and in the area we are considering a point starting from x to a point starting ending at x plus d x. So, this is the d x length we are considering which has been displaced now. So, what is the sum of the vertical forces due to the this tension the tension acting along this d x is t is d z. This is the tension acting t is d z. So, a t d z tension is acting here and similarly a t d z tension is acting here sorry the force is acting here. T is the tension and t into d z is the force acting along that direction. So, this is the force acting along these directions and theta is the displacement. 
So, what we see here is that let us find out what is the vertical force acting along the y direction. So, if this is T d z which is the force along the length of the membrane, then its vertical component. So, if this is the angle theta, this will be angle theta sorry if this is the angle theta this will be angle theta. So, this will be the angle theta here and therefore, its vertical component will be somewhere across this which will be T d z sin theta. Similarly, whatever is the value of so, this is the value of theta at point x then there will be some value of theta at point y also. So, the way it is defined is it is the it is the deflection from the horizontal. So, from the horizontal this is theta dash here, then the vertical force here would be what? This is theta, then the vertical component of this would be this becomes theta and the vertical component becomes T d z of sin theta. So, the vertical component in both both the ends is T d z into sin theta, but it is this theta value which then varies as a function of x. So, we can write the vertical forces. So, the net vertical force will be a difference between the two. So, it will be T d z sin theta at the point of x plus d x minus T d z sin theta at the point x. Now, tension is uniform throughout and d z is the uh, length which is also constant with respect to x. So, we can take out these constants outside. So, what we get is T d z times of sin theta value at x plus d x minus sin theta value at x. So, this gives us the net vertical force acting. So, now the net vertical force acting due to the tension T d z. So, this now if we use Taylor series expansion. So, if we using Taylor's series expansion, if we use this case then this particular th thing becomes if you use Taylor series expansion on this expression then this can be given as T d z and this expression becomes del by del x of sin theta into d x because sin theta x plus d x minus sin theta x divided by d x is simply del sin theta by del x. So, from that Taylor series expansion this is the overall value what I am getting here. Okay. Now, we know that all the acoustic processes they involve very small fluctuations. So, theta is small. So, when theta is very small then sin theta is approximately equal to tan theta which can be written as del y by del x. So, if we replace this sin theta by del y by del x what we could get is T d z del, del by del x of del y by del x. So, it is the double derivative of y. So, this is the expression T del square y by del x square into d x d z. Similarly, if you solve what is the net vertical force acting, what is going to be the total vertical force due to this T d x and the same way you carry out. So, you will get is the net vertical force due to this particular kind of tension is T into del square y by del x del z square into d x d z. So, here we di differentiated it with respect to x in the other case we differentiate it with respect to z. So, this is the expression you get. So, the total vertical force then due to both these components in along the x axis and along the y axis the total vertical force due to both these uh, de deflection along the x and y axis is then given by summation of f 1 plus f 2 which is T del square y by del x square plus del square y by del z square into d x by d z and by Newton's second law this net vertical force will be equal to the mass into the acceleration at that point. So, it will become the mass into the acceleration of that elemental area of the membrane. So, this particular force is mass, mass which is density into the volume. So, if h is the thickness of the membrane 
and dx and dz become the area which we have considered. So, thickness into area gives you the total volume multiplied by density which gives you the mass and acceleration is del square y by del t square. Now, let us replace and give a general variable w for transverse displacement of membrane because sometimes the membrane can be along x y axis or y z axis and so on. So, it can be along any such plane y z plane x z plane and so on. So, let us change the variable into a new variable called w which is the transverse displacement. So, you can replace this and the expression becomes nabla square in this becomes nabla square of w this d x d z cancels out is equal to rho h by t del square w by del t square. So, this becomes the overall equation this I have put as 0 this is the free vibration equation nabla square w minus rho h by t del square w by del t square again this becomes equals to 0 for a vibration response. Now, if some external pressure is acting then the same equation can be used. So, you had T into nabla square w. So, T into nabla square w. So, you had T into nabla square w into d x d z into d x d z plus the external. So, the total when some external pressure is acting then the total force will be the sum of the forces due to this tension plus the force due to the pressure acting. So, you will also have this pressure times the area. So, this will be the net force which will be equal to mass into acceleration. So, this expression. So, when you solve it this d x d z cancels out from every end. So, what you get is T nabla square w minus rho h del square w by del t square is equal to minus p where p is the external pressure being applied. This is the thickness of the membrane this is the density of the membrane and this is the uniform tension across the membrane. So, overall what we get is that when a membrane when we have a stretched membrane a uniformly stretched membrane and some excitation is given to it then the response of the membrane depends upon some external parameters as well as internal parameters. So, it obviously depends upon this inherent properties which is the membrane density and thickness rho and h value but it also depends upon an external parameter called the external tension that is applied to the membrane. Whereas, if you have a thin panel then the vibration response is given by this. So, in this case it depends upon again the membrane density, the, members, the panel density, the panel thickness, it also depends upon its Young's modulus and Poisson ratio. So, all inbuilt properties. So, what we see from these two vibration response is that in case of a membrane uh, the vibration response will also depend upon its tension. So, the response will depend on the tension. So, if suppose you have a mechanism through which you can tune the tension in the real time. So, let us say we had a stretched membrane and some sound waves were hitting it or some excitation was given. So, based on what type of excitation is given we are tuning the tension in the membrane. So, we had some mechanism to stretch it, de-stretch it and so on. So, if we can change the tension in the real time then we can use it to change its response in the real time and when we change the response of the membrane in the real time then we can use it for adaptive noise control. So, this is, so I discussed this particular thing just to show you that uh, the membrane vibration what is the advantage of using a membrane the advantage of using a limp membrane is that the response of this also depends upon an external property called tension and when this tension is tuned in the real time then adaptive noise control is possible ok. So, after learning about one potential benefit of using a membrane let us just briefly see what are the two types of unit cells. So, both of them were proposed by Lee et al 2009. So, the first type of unit cell was proposed by this scientist Lee et al 2009. So, again I am showing you here you have a sub wavelength waveguide. These are all rigid boundaries and a stretched membrane is in between and a plane wave front is incident. And in the second case you have a waveguide a section of a waveguide or a hollow tube 
and inside this hollow tube you have a stretched membrane and a center mass attached. So, in our next lecture I will go through how do represent these two unit cells in the form of a mass spring model and then how to derive the effective mass density. So, thank you for listening, see you for the next lecture, thank you.